Well, good morning and welcome to worship as we continue the season of Advent. We are anticipating and looking forward to the second coming of Christ. This moment and season of hope is what Advent is all about. It's this worship of Jesus and knowing that because he has come to be our Savior, we could trust in his promises that he will return once again to heal all things and restore all things and conquer all sin, death, and even the devil, and so that we will be with him forever. And so as we find comfort in that good news of Jesus and his promises, we celebrate with our opening hymn, and I invite you to stand as we join together in singing hymn number 348. God of the worship in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Amen. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. This time you're invited to kneel, sit, or stand for a time of silent reflection and self-examination. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. May the Lord who has begun this good work in us bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Please stand as we join together in the reading of the psalm of the day which comes from Psalm chapter 85. 
Show us your steadfast love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people, to his saints. But let them not turn back to folly. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast hope and faithfulness meet. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Faithfulness springs up from the ground, and righteousness looks down from the sky. Yes, the Lord will give what is good, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him and make his footsteps away. You may be seated. Please stand for the Kyrie and the prayer of the day. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we implore you to hear our prayers and to lighten the darkness of our hearts by your gracious visitation. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated for the scripture readings. The Old Testament reading is from Malachi chapter 4. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble, The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall, and you shall tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord of hosts. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and just decrees that I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. 
Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes, and he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle reading this morning is from 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Blessed be God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we shall share abundantly in comfort too. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand for the gospel reading. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the first chapter. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. Now while he was serving as priest before God when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great before the Lord, and he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fatherless to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. And Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God. And I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. This is the gospel of the Lord. You may be seated as we join together in singing hymn number 361.
we dive into God's word this morning. I used to do this when I first got here, then I stopped. I have no idea why I stopped. But now we're going to do it again. We're going to start with prayer. So some of you might remember when I first got here before we would do the sermon, we would dive in with prayer. So we're going to take a moment for a few prayers. So the first prayer that we're going to pray silently on our own is just praying for our own hearts and minds that whatever is on them, whatever worries or anxieties, we would cast upon the Lord so that the Holy Spirit would speak to us through his word. So we go to God in prayer. And the second prayer, I would ask that you would pray for me, that the Holy Spirit would speak his word clearly through me, that the gospel and the message of Jesus would be proclaimed rightly and well. Psalm 19 says, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. So this morning, we are continuing the season of Advent, which is a season of waiting, which is like the worst kind of season, right? Nobody enjoys waiting whatsoever. And Christmas, as wonderful as it is, teaches us from a very early age to hate waiting, right? Anybody remember when you were a kid and you're counting down the days to the end of the semester? and when break would happen, and that, that way you'd have two to three weeks to forget everything you were supposed to learn in the past few months, right, and then come back and, like, I always came back and it was like, I don't know math anymore. Like, everything you taught me back then, it's gone, right? But, and then there's not just the waiting for school breaks then, there's also the waiting for gifts. How many of you are really good at snooping around for gifts? Anybody want to admit that? In my experience, there's two types of people in the world. There's the people that just want to be surprised on Christmas Day, and they patiently wait for whatever they're going to get, right? There's some of you, you're good, mature people. Thank you for being that way. And then there's people like me and my brother who absolutely cannot wait for gifts, right? My wife laughs at me because there's times where I just give her her gifts before Christmas because I'm just like, I want you to be excited, I'm excited, so let's just open the gifts now, right? And then I've learned that she appreciates if I'm not like that all the time, and that I at least save one present for Christmas, all right? (laughs) But my brother and I, we were little spies when it came to waiting for Christmas gifts. We'd wait for our parents to buy the gifts. They'd go out when we were with our dad for Thanksgiving. My mom and stepdad would go out and do all their shopping because we were in the house. And my brother and I had walkie-talkies and binoculars. I'm serious, y'all, right? And one of us would be in one area of the house, and the other one would be in the other area. We were talking on walkie-talkies, letting each other know what we see mom wrapping and the shape and the size of the box and all that. And then eventually we discovered the power of steam, where you could steam open tape. And on there it is, and he put it back on and slide it under the tree, and nobody knows except for mom knew, because we're dumb and mom knows everything. All right? And it got to the point where my parents began for years, and they still do this to the two of us, not to my sisters, but to us. They locked all the gifts in a closet and would hide the key from us. And then after Christmas Eve service, which the service that we went to growing up ended at midnight. And so we would fall asleep during the service because that's what you do as a kid. And then when your mom wakes you up and says, we're going home now, you realize, man, we're really close to Christmas morning. And then we can't fall back asleep. It's that fun trick, right? So they would wait until we were asleep in our rooms and then they would unlock the closet and bring all the gifts out for us. Because we had a hard time waiting, all right? We just couldn't do it. We were like, no, we want the gifts now, let's see. We have all this anticipation. We made these lists. We want to know, did we get what we asked for, what we were looking forward to, or we're hoping for? And so from a very early age, we know what waiting feels like, right? Sometimes there's a little bit of excitement for it, right? Like, oh, this is going to be great. This is going to be amazing, whatever it is, whether it's a gift at Christmas, maybe it's an event you're going to, or seeing family or friends, whatever it might be, right? We get excited. There's this anticipation. But there's also this tension of, I don't, 
you know, I don't want the waiting to be there anymore, right? I, I don't want more time to be in between me and what I'm waiting for and hoping for. And that's what Advent is. As wonderful as it is to sing the Christmas carols and all, have all the decorations up and, and remember that Jesus has come and been born to be our Savior, what Advent really is for you and me is a season of waiting when our Savior comes back to fulfill all of the promises of God's word, right? And so everything that we're waiting for and, and hoping for, everything in life that, that makes our heart ache and we cry out like, it shouldn't be this way. When are things gonna get better? When is healing gonna happen? When is God gonna do something about it? Is this anticipation of waiting for Jesus to come back. And at the foundation of the season of Advent, that's what we're doing. We're waiting and hoping for his return, that he will accomplish all that God's word promises to us, that he will finally keep all of his promises and fulfill all of his promises towards you and me and the whole world. But waiting stinks, <laughs> right? Like it's funny when you're a little kid, right? My brother and I have walkie talkies and we're spying on our parents to figure out what we got for Christmas because we can't wait. But when you and I hit the reality of life and we know the promises of God, we know what Jesus is going to do when he returns because they're so clearly spoken to us in God's word, guess what hurts? Guess what is a struggle for us? Waiting, right? Like, like wouldn't it be great if he just sped up the calendar a little bit on certain things, Right? If you, could, if you could perform that miracle now, Lord, that would be great. If you could make this relationship reconciled now, that would be wonderful. Lord, if you could give me that job now rather than later, right? So often we struggle with waiting and trusting God's timing. Now, the interesting thing about waiting is the way the Bible talks about it. There's a couple of words in your Bible that we translate as hope, and one of them is yachal, and it means to wait for. And so when the authors of the scriptures are talking about in the Psalms and the prophets of waiting on the Lord, right, and, and those who put their hope in the Lord, it's the same word, yachal. So in the Bible, the idea of waiting and hope are connected. They're the same thing. It's anticipating a better future. So that's what we're waiting for. That's what we're hoping for. And that's what the people of God, way back at the first Christmas, the first Advent, were doing. They were waiting and they were hoping like one day God has made these promises and he's going to keep them. We don't know when, but we're going to, to wait on the Lord. We're going to trust in his promises. We're going to trust in his timing. We're going to put our hope in his word. And that sounds wonderful, doesn't it? Because we get to sing, O Little Town of Bethlehem. And we, we know that it happened. But for the people of God, those promises happen. And then there's something else that happens. There's no prophet for over 400 years. In the Old Testament reading that Bob read for us, that Malachi makes this promise that, hey, one day I'm going to send a messenger who's going to prepare the way of the Lord. And when the Lord comes, he's going to bring healing. Right? He's going to be restoration. He's going to bring all the things that our hearts are longing for. Because we know the world is messed up and, and not the way it should be. And we're waiting for that better future. Now, if you're living in the day of Malachi, guess what you're excited about? Christmas, just like you and I are excited about Christmas. You're like, awesome. Wow, what a wonderful promise. What if I gave you a present and it was wrapped and I said, you're going to love it. And I said, you can enjoy it and open it in 400 years. Yeah. Oh, yeah. How many of you are like, my pastor loves me. No, you'd be like, what a jerk. Some of you would turn into me. You'd get that steam out. You'd pop that back. <laughs> you'd be like, oh, that'll be cool in 400 years. But that's what the people of God are going through. God makes this wonderful, beautiful promise that Christmas is going to happen, that he's going to send a messenger, and that messenger who we know is John the Baptist is going to prepare the way of the Lord. It's like, oh, it's coming. 
And I've got to wait. And I've got to hope. And I've got to sit here and be not in control of the timeline and simply trust that God will be faithful to his promises. Now, I know we're in church. So the correct answer is what? Of course I what? Trust God's promises, right? Of, of course his timing is better than my timing. Of course he's got a good plan. Of course his word is true and I don't have to worry about anything. Right? We all know that's true. Right? And how many of you have ever worried about something? Even though God's in control of it. How many of you have ever said, you know what? I'm all right not being in control this time. I'm just going to let God be in control instead. Anybody? Now, sometimes you're just forced into it, right? But like, I mean like willingly, just rejoicefully saying, oh, thank goodness I'm not in control anymore. Now, most of us are going to be like, I'm going to freak out now, and I'm going to be in control of the timeline. Right? And we're like, oh, of course, God keeps his promises. Of course he does, right? And how many of you have ever prayed, though, and then had to wait and felt that pain? Because prayer is good. We trust God and his promises. Oh, and his word is powerful. We know that one day, and this is what we're waiting for, and one day he's going to what? He's going to return. He's going to heal all things, and it's going to be perfect. So how many of you have ever prayed, though, in that hope and then been a little disappointed because you had to keep waiting? So on the one hand, we want to say, yeah, of course, God's promises are good, and of course, he keeps his promises, and of course, I could trust his word, and of course, his timing is perfect and better than mine until the reality of life hits, right? And we get impatient. I've prayed for this. I've waited for this. Lord, I've told you that I need this relationship. I need this job. Or I'm wanting this thing to get better. I'm, I'm waiting for a better future. I'm waiting for things to improve. And Lord, you know what I need. And I've been asking. And then sometimes what? How many of you have ever had to keep on waiting? And keep on going, okay, well, I guess I'll keep hoping. See, this is the, the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth and all the people that we see in Luke 1 and at that time. God makes this wonderful promise. The Messiah is coming. There's going to be a prophet that prepares his way, and it's going to be amazing. And then God doesn't speak for 400 years. That's a long time to wait. It's a long time to go, oh, okay, he's keeping his promise. And then to make it more personal, though, in this story, in Luke 1, verse 5, if you have a Bible, I encourage you to open it. It says, in the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah, and he had a wife named Elizabeth. And verse 6 says, they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. And verse 7, but they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. So it's one thing to be like, oh, okay, yeah, the big grand narrative of human history, 400 years God waits to send John the Baptist, right? And I think for those of us who have been in church a while and we've heard the stories, we go, yeah, but that's okay because Christmas came, right? <laughs> and he kept his promise and, and we know he's going to do it in the future. But see, the real test is when it becomes about your own individual life, right? Because watching... Zechariah and Elizabeth and all the others wait 400 years for Jesus and Christmas to happen. You know what? That's really easy for you and me. You know why? Because we didn't have to do the waiting. <laughs> it's a lot of, right? It's really easy to tell somebody else, it's not going to take that long. Hey, don't worry. Like, distract yourself. Do something else. The time will pass, right? When you're the person not waiting, it's really easy to tell other people to what? Be patient. Just wait. And then when you're the person waiting, it's your friend comes back to you and says, why don't you be patient? You're like, why don't you get away from me before I hurt you? Right? Because it's harder when it's about your heart 
in your life and the things you're waiting for and the things you and I are hoping for that will bring a better future and an improvement in life and the things that God has promised to us. Now, a few things are incredibly important to understand about Elizabeth and Zechariah here. One is that the key part of the story is that she's barren, they have no children. And in that time, in the first century, it was assumed that if you were childless, it's because you were cursed by God. You were not, you must have had some secret sin that we didn't know about. You must have been really bad. And so God is punishing you for something. That was their mentality. Which is why it's so important that Luke includes this line which says, both of them were righteous and both of them were blameless following the ways of the Lord, right? So these are like super duper awesome followers of God's word and worshipers of God and servants of God. And yet what is happening to them? They're having to wait, right? That's what they're doing. They're, they're waiting. They're praying, and they're waiting, and they're hoping. And the way that Luke talks about it by be, being like this, where he says, and then they were advanced in years. He's hinting at, and you can kind of see it in the rest of the story, that they kind of got to the point where we're done praying, right? Because what? We're advanced in years. It's not happening. God's against us. He's not going to answer that prayer. They're, they're kind of to the point where, yeah, I prayed about it. I hoped for it. I waited. Right? And sometimes we get to that point, even as people that love Jesus and, and trust in God's word and trust in his goodness, that what? I prayed about it, man. Right? I, I've waited. <laughs> I've really hoped. I have, I have told the Lord a lot of times. And sometimes we get to the point where what? And we just tell ourselves, well, maybe it's just not meant to be. And it's not part of God's plan or whatever. And so what do we do? Probably like Zechariah and Elizabeth, you do what? You kind of give up. I'm, I'm done praying about that. I'm, I'm going to move on now. I'm, I'm tired of what? being disappointed, right? Imagine for Zechariah and Elizabeth, right? And multiple times this story says they're what? They're old and they're advanced in years, right? Luke is trying to subtly hint, not so subtly hint, what? It, it's passed them by, right? That, that thing they were waiting for, that, that experience they were hoping for and praying for is what? It's gone. But before they get to that point, you have to assume because they're what? Righteous and blameless before God, right? In all of his ways and statutes. What does the Lord tell us to do in the Bible all the time? Pray, right? Trust in him and his timing. So you'd have to imagine that over the years and probably over the decades, what are Zechariah and Elizabeth doing? Praying, right? Bringing it to the Lord. Say, we're, we're hoping and we're waiting and we're trusting in you, but... This is hard. It's weighing on us. It, it's hurting. And we, we really want this thing to happen for us. And how many times do you think they were disappointed after a few decades of praying, right? See, one of the things I, I, I love about this story is that it's human, right? We, we, we all have that experience of waiting and hoping, and then what? Being disappointed. Anybody been disappointed? Now, here's a real fun question that makes families awkward. So I'm going to make you ask it to yourselves. You could talk about it on your car ride home. How many of you have ever been disappointed on Christmas morning? I want honest answers right now. I remember this very clearly one Christmas because I'm obsessed with the gifts. Okay, guys, just letting you know. It's a problem I've had since I was a, a little kid. And it hasn't gotten better, all right? <laughs> Very detailed, articulate in my list. I, would ha I had a ranking system, and I let the family know, this is what I want. And I, would, and I had tier systems, too. I was like, okay, if this is too much or whatever, 
This is the next tier. And here are the top order of gifts in tier two. My family, I don't know, they had to put up with a lot, okay? I remember one year, something didn't get clearly communicated to the rest of the family by my parents. And so we were all over at Nanny and Grandpa's house, all 30 of us. It would take three hours to go through the gifts because there were so many of us. And my nanny had this rule of one gift at a time. Just let you know, <laughs> when there's 30 people getting multiple gifts, one gift at a time, everybody starts getting hungry at the end. Okay, it takes a while. And I remember I got a gift from one of my aunts and uncles who will remain nameless right now, not to embarrass them. And I got a duplicate gift. Now, if you're a mature person, which I'm not, you go, oh, it's okay, there's gift receipts. You say thank you, return it. Now on the outside, I pretended to be ecstatic and happy because my mom was glaring at me. <laughs> so I was, don't you say a word, yes ma'am, okay. Right, on the inside, I was dead. I was disappointed, why? Because my childlike brain built up like what? I want these gifts and it's gonna be awesome and it's gonna be this great thing to celebrate and then when you get a duplicate one, what do you think? I've already got that, that's no good, right? Now, I'm ridiculous, so this is a ridiculous example, but in real life, how often do we wait and hope for something? with great anticipation, right? That this will make life better. It could be a relationship, it could be a friendship, it could be a move, it could be a new home, new car, it could be a new job, it could be a, a whole lot of things, right? We're praying about it, we're waiting for it. And then sometimes you actually get it, right? And anybody ever been disappointed even though you got what you're waiting for and hoping? Because it wasn't all that you thought it would be, right? Am I the only one that got a duplicate gift growing up? Come on, right? And then there's other times where you're disappointed because of what? Like Zechariah and Elizabeth, it didn't happen at all. You're waiting, you're hoping, you're praying. And a lot of times like Elizabeth and Zechariah, we're probably pouring our hearts out to God to the point where I don't know what else to say, Lord. I don't know how else to express it to you. I don't know how else to make this prayer better for you, right? Anybody been there? And then what? And it's just more waiting, more hoping. And then sometimes eventually Zechariah and Elizabeth, I guess it's just not gonna happen. So this is them. These, these are people that love the Lord they're righteous, they're blameless, and they're praying, and they're praying for good things that will honor the Lord, and guess what? It's just more waiting, more disappointment. So the, one of the encouraging things from this story is that if you've ever been there and felt like, I'm praying, I'm waiting, I'm hoping, when is this thing gonna happen? And if you've ever been to the point where it's been a while and you kind of just say, I don't know if I could pray about it anymore. You are not a bad person, okay? You're not a bad Christian because you're just like Zechariah and Elizabeth. And what does the Bible say about them? They're righteous and they're blameless. They love the Lord. What it means is that you and I are human and waiting stinks. <laughs> Right, you know, waiting for presents and things like that, it's fun. But in real life, when you're waiting and you're hoping and you're praying and you're pouring your heart out to God, waiting is really hard sometimes. Hoping can be really heavy sometimes. And disappointment can really hurt. So this is Zechariah and Elizabeth. This is the pattern they're going through. And the one day, Zechariah gets called into the temple. He gets selected by Lot that it's his turn to go into the Holy of Holies and to burn incense and do some rituals, which is a great and tremendous honor. And he meets an angel, which everybody I've ever met as a pastor always goes, you know, pastor, it'd just be really cool if the Lord spoke to me, which, okay, I'm sarcastic. I think most of you know this by now. I usually open a Bible and say, here you go, all right? But what most people mean by that is, I just, 
I've been waiting and I've been praying and I've been hoping and I just want the Lord to make it clear to me, is it going to happen or not, right? Is, what am I supposed to do next? Should I pray for something else? Should I give up on this? And so what we do is we cry out and we're like, I want the Lord to make it clear. Could he send an angel like he did in the Bible? Which means, I don't think you've read the stories. <laughs> Because every time an angel shows up, every single person goes, I'm dead. Right? Like nobody ever in the Bible goes, yay, an angel. Right? They all become absolutely terrified. Even a guy like Zechariah, who's a priest serving in the temple. An angel shows up to him in verse 13. says, do not be afraid. Because Zechariah was terrified. Zechariah, now here's an interesting thing. Your prayer has been heard. And your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son. You shall call his name John. Now, that's the part we know. But I want to pause here for a moment on the phrase, your prayer has been heard. Now, just think for a moment. What did Luke say? Elizabeth is what? She's barren. They haven't been able to have a child. And guess what? They're both advanced in age. Which means what? Let's just read between the lines, guys. What do you think Zechariah and Elizabeth have, have done? They've gotten old. They've realized what? It's not happening. So what do you think they've done? It's not a trick. They've stopped praying, right? So when the angel says, your prayer has been heard, what do you think Zechariah is praying? Thinks is his prayer has been heard. Which one? You know? And then the angel has to be like, your wife's going to have a baby. And Zechariah's like, that one? <laughs> we said that 30 years ago. We prayed that dozens and hundreds and thousands of times. And that's what waiting looks like. Right? It wasn't that his prayers were wasted. It wasn't that the the prayers were ignored. It wasn't that the prayers were pointless. It was what? It was a season of waiting and hoping. That doesn't make it easy. But I know from talking to many of you that a lot of you have prayers like Zechariah and Elizabeth. You've been praying them a long time. Some of you have joked with me that you've been praying certain prayers longer than I've been alive. Great, don't give up. Because if you would have asked Zechariah that morning as he's going into the temple, you know Zech, did you pray today? He would have said, yeah, I prayed. And then you would have said, oh, the Lord's gonna answer your prayer. Which one do you think it is? I promise you, there's not a single chance in the world that Zechariah would have been, I think it's the one for a baby. Why? Because that was a long time ago. But sometimes that's what waiting looks like, right? There's 400 years between the promise and John the Baptist. Zechariah has been praying for decades. And it took a while, so long so that they, they got discouraged. They probably got disappointed and gave up. And then God said, I've heard your prayer. I was just waiting to answer it in my timing. So the angel says this wonderful promise, right? In verse 14, here's more good news, more good promise for Zechariah. You will have joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth. Well, that's great. And he goes on, he describes John the Baptist's life and all the wonderful promises that come with it. And in verse 18, this is the part I love the most. Zechariah said to the angel, how shall I know this? Now, in their world, both in the Greek and Hebrew language, no didn't just mean head knowledge, it meant like an intimate experience. Like, so what he's really asking is, how do I know this is true? Which is a fair question, right? Because how many times do you think Zechariah and Elizabeth have been disappointed? Praying, disappointed, praying, disappointed. Eventually, guess what? You're a little skeptical, right? You're going to think, hey, how, how is this true, right? How many of you have ever been disappointed in life, right? Something sounded too good to be true, and then it was. So guess what happened the next time something awesome came along your way? What did you do? Did you rejoice or did you act like Zechariah and go, I don't know. How do I know this is true? How do I, how do I know this isn't going to let me down again? Anybody. 
Any skeptics in the crowd today? Right? You, you just, oh yeah, I've been burned before. Not doing, let, right? Anybody say to yourself, I'm not letting myself get hurt again? No, I'm not going to get my emotions too excited. And that's Zechariah. He's human. He's asking a very human question, right? And even if it's not even just about God, it's just anything in life. It's a job, it's a friendship, it's a, right, whatever it be, might be. It can be, well, not this time, because last time I built it all up and it wasn't all that I hoped for and I got a little disappointed, so guess what you're going to do next time? I'm going to be very cautious, very guarded, not going to get hurt. So Zechariah acts like you and me to the angel and he goes, are you sure? <laughs> Like, how do I know I'm not going to get disappointed again? Because, you know, 400 years ago, God made this promise, and we're still waiting. So how do I know it's going to be true this time? I've been praying a long time for this. I've been waiting my whole life. I've been putting my hope in the Lord, and it still hasn't happened. So how do I know you're telling me the truth? And that's Zechariah's question. He says, for I am an old man... Now listen to how smart he is, though. I'm an old man, and my wife is advancing years. Those are two different words. He's a smart guy. Over the years, he's gotten wiser. Fellas, you notice that? He's like, I'm old. She's not, though. She's just aged like a fine wine, and she's mature and wise and wonderful. Right? Just That's a, some good marriage advice there from Zechariah. But what is he doing? He's being very what? Practical. He's being realistic with God's promises. I've waited, I've hoped. I'm done being disappointed. He's like, I know the way the world works. I'm old. I'm not going to say it, but she's old too. And she's been barren this whole time. We're not having kids. It's not happening. And so here's what happens. The angel speaks back and answered, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. Now, on the one hand, Gabriel's being very comforting, right? He's saying, I was sent to bring you what? Good news. For your weary, disappointed, tired of waiting heart, here is good news of God keeping his promise for you. On the other hand, he's also being stern because he says what? I stand in the presence of God, so you be quiet. Who, right? You're like, I've been waiting, I've been trying, I know how things work. I'm wise, I'm smart, I'm experienced in the real world. The Lord's promises, they don't make any sense. And so what does the angel tell Gabriel, or Gabriel tell Zechariah? Hey, you're not as smart or as wise or as in control as you think you are. I stand in the presence of God, so I'm not speaking lies are falsehoods. I'm telling you the truth, and it's meant to bring you good news that the Lord is keeping his promise to you. And sometimes we need that wake-up call in life. We get disappointed, we struggle, and then like Zechariah, we question God. How can this be? How do I know his promises are worthwhile? Because I, how many of you probably don't walk around thinking, saying this, think, I'm smarter than people. No, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, okay? <laughs> but most of us think, yeah, I'm smarter than them. I'm better than them. I know a thing or two, right? I'm experienced. I know what the real world is like. And then we end up treating God that way, just like Zechariah. I'll tell you what's going on, Lord. And sometimes we need to be humble to realize, like Zechariah, I am not God. I'm not in control of the timeline. I'm not in control of the waiting. I'm not in control of when the prayer is answered. And so instead, our posture should be, am I trusting in his promises and his good news? And this is what the angel says to him. Behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place because you did not believe my words, right? So the issue for Zechariah is what? He doesn't believe what? God's words of promise. But here's the good news for Zechariah and for you and me and every time that you and I struggle and wrestle with God, every time you and I try to take control and tell him what to do, here's what the angel says to Zechariah. My words 
which will be fulfilled in what? Their time. So here's the good news. Zechariah messes up. God says, I, he sends an angel, just like you always bug me about wanting. <laughs> right? He sends an angel from heaven and says, here is the good news. Here's the exact promise the Lord is making to you. And Zechariah's response is, I doubt it. I don't believe the promise. I don't believe the words. But here's the good news, because you and I do the same thing all the time. The angel says, even though you didn't believe, Zechariah, God's promises are still going to come true and happen. That's really comforting. That God's promises don't depend on you and me. As awesome as you are, (laughs) they don't depend on you. They don't depend on our faith. They don't depend on how much faith we have or how little faith we have. They don't depend on how trusting we are in a certain moment or untrusting. And it doesn't matter how faithful we are or unfaithful we are. The angel tells Zechariah, my words, which are God's words, are happening in their time. That's such good news for you to be because just like Zechariah, sometimes we're going to ask God, how, how, how do I know? How can I really trust this? Are you going to really keep your promise? And the good news, just like for Zechariah, for you and me, is that God says, my words and my promises are happening in their time. Doesn't matter about you and me or our faith or how often it wavers or teeter-totters. His promises still happen in their time. So you and I can take a deep breath and go, oh, okay. God's going to keep his promises regardless of how I'm feeling or how I'm doing. Whether I am totally believing in it and trusting in it or if I'm really struggling and skeptical like Zechariah because I've been disappointed one too many times. The other interesting thing about Zechariah is his name. His name means to be remembered by God, which I think God was trying to teach him a lesson. (laughs) Just like he's always trying to teach you and me a lesson. Right? It's been 400 years since I made that promise. And let's face it, some of us go four minutes and think God has forgotten, right? I prayed about it. And how many of you impatiently go, amen, and you're like, okay, Lord, I'm ready. Anybody do that? Or just like, I said the prayer, and where should it happen? Okay, it didn't. It's been 400 years. Perhaps at a certain point, some people thought, maybe God has forgotten his promise. Zechariah and Elizabeth, it's been decades. Tired of waiting, tired of hoping. I think God's forgotten. And the good news of this story is that God says, oh, Zechariah, your name means remembered by God. The whole point of the story is God's like, I haven't forgotten Zechariah. I haven't forgotten Elizabeth. I haven't forgotten my people. I haven't forgotten my promises. And the good news for you and me is that it's still the same good news, that no matter how many times we feel disappointed, we get tired of waiting, or we are skeptical like Zechariah, like, is this really good news? Is God really going to do it? The word of the angel to Zechariah, the word of the Lord to you and me is, my words, my promises are going to happen in their time. And for those of you who are still sitting there going like Zechariah, how do I know this is good and true for me? The answer is Jesus. And I have a Bible verse for you that I want you to write down, circle, highlight, memorize. So 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. For all the promises of God find their yes in Jesus. Here's the reality of life. We're going to pray a lot. We're going to hope a lot for different things. We're going to wait a lot. And just like Zechariah and Elizabeth, sometimes we're going to be disappointed. We're going to want to stop praying. We're going to think there's no way that prayer from decades ago and years ago or a lifetime ago, God has heard or is going to answer. And sometimes we're going to think maybe God has forgotten about me. 
Maybe he's forgotten his promise because it's been a while. I'm tired of waiting. And the hope of Advent is that we remember that Jesus came and was born and God kept his promise back then and he's gonna keep his promise in the future. And how you and I know is because of who Jesus is. And as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 1 verse 20, all the promises of God find their yes in Jesus. It was true for Zechariah and Elizabeth. It's true for you and me that God will keep his promises his word and his promises will happen in their time. So you and I, we can wait patiently because we're waiting in hope because we know who Jesus is and we know that he's a God who keeps his word. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks that you are a God of promises who also fulfills and keeps all of his promises. We thank you that we can have assurance of this and confidence in our faith that because of Jesus, all of your promises find their yes and find their fulfillment. And as we wait here in this life and all of its ups and downs and disappointments and hurts, we know that we have a true and everlasting hope because you will keep your promise one day to return and to heal and restore all things, conquering sin, death, and the devil once and for all. In your name we pray, amen. I invite you to stand as we go to our Lord in prayer. God, our Father in heaven, look with mercy upon us, your children, on earth, and grant us grace that your holy name may be hallowed by us in all the world through the pure and true teaching of your word and the fervent love shown forth in our lives. Lord, in your mercy. Your may your kingdom come to us and expand. Bring all transgressors and those who are blind and abound in the devil's kingdom to know Jesus Christ, your son, by faith that the number of Christians may be increased. Lord, in your mercy, strengthen us by your spirit according to your will, both in life and in death, in the midst of both good and evil things, that our own wills may be crucified daily in sacrifice to your good and gracious will. Into your merciful hands we commend all those who are mourning and grieving the loss of life and loved ones. We pray especially for Bob Burroughs and his family after the passing of his brother Chuck. We also pray for Tom Van Duzer and their family after the passing of Pastor Bill Van Duzer. Lord, may you comfort all hearts that are mourning and grieving with the sure promise of eternal life and resurrection through Jesus Christ. We also pray for all those who are in need of healing and care, praying for them at all times. Thy will be done. Lord, in your mercy. Grant us our daily bread. Preserve us from greed and selfish cares and help us trust in you to provide for all our needs. Lord, in your mercy. Forgive us our sins as we also forgive those who sin against us, so that our hearts may be at peace and may rejoice in a good conscience before you, and that sin, no sin may ever frighten or alarm us. Lord, in your mercy. Lead us not into temptation, O Lord, but help us by your spirit to subdue our flesh to turn from the world and its ways and to overcome the devil with all his wiles. Lord, in your mercy. And lastly, O Heavenly Father, deliver us from all evil, both body and soul, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated as we continue our worship by presenting our tithes and offerings.
Please stand for the service of the sacrament. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord our God, King of all creation. For you've had mercy upon us and given your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Grant us your spirit, gracious Father, that we may give heed to the testament of your Son in true faith, and above all, firmly take to heart the words with which Christ gives to us his body and blood for our forgiveness. By your grace, lead us to remember and give thanks for the boundless love which he manifested to us, when by pouring out his precious blood, he saved us from your righteous wrath and from sin, death, and hell. Grant that we may receive the bread and wine, that is, his body and blood, as a gift, guarantee, and pledge of his salvation. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship, with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We join together as a family of faith in praying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night when he's betrayed, took bread. When he gave it thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament, my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
respectfully stand to receive the communion blessing. May this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve in your faith to life everlasting. Go in his peace. Amen. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy, you would strengthen us to the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Just two brief announcements before the blessing. One is that this Wednesday at 7 p.m. will be our final uh, midweek service for Advent this year. So come on out. We will continue worshiping Jesus and hearing words of comfort of his coming to be our Savior and to redeem us from sin, death, and the devil. And then the other is to say thank you to uh, Lauren Sider and the education team and all the volunteers who put on Advent Village last week. It was a wonderful time together. So even though we're Lutheran, we're going to clap now. All right. She really appreciates me pointing her out by name, too. So, But if you see her, say thank you to her and everybody else that served and helped out in different ways to make it a wonderful uh, time of fellowship and focus on Jesus. So with that, we go to the Benedict Thomas. Let us bless the Lord. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Amen.